coming up on The Arts Connection. The art of collecting art. Where do you begin? You, you need to try and get beyond the intimidation factor. You really need to simply allow yourself to enjoy a piece of art. Plus, we dish up a slice of Americana with a pie festival and learn the art of pie judging. Oh, yeah. yeah. It could be a, a great pie, but it needs a lot of work. And we visit the Wayne Dinch Performing Arts Center in Sanford. We're able to do more rehearsals. We currently have four shows in rehearsal, which we wouldn't even been able to do before. All that and more up next on The Arts Connection. The Arts Connection is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to WMFE from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Arts Connection, your program about all things creative here in Central Florida. I'm Cecily Wilson and this week we're joining you from the Wayne Dench Performing Arts Center in Sanford. Now many of you may remember it as the Helen Stairs Theater and you're going to learn more about the name change a little later on in our program. But first, it's practically a household word, Tupperware. I grew up on it. In fact, the home parties that made this product famous were largely the creative genius of an Orlando woman. And now local newsman and author Bob Keeling uncovers her story with a book that reveals the truth. Kristen Kenny has more. It's a product that has transformed kitchens across the globe. A colorful plastic product that got its big break right here in Orlando, thanks to the ingenious marketing strategy of a woman named Brownie Wise. But while Tupperware is a household name, Brownie has been anything but. And it's the story of this forgotten local legend that caught the attention of Emmy Award winning news reporter Bob Keeling. I had seen a PBS documentary about Brownie Wise and, and Tupperware and Earl Tupper and I thought, wow, that, that would make a great story. And I wanted to find out exactly what happened to Brownie and how she became uh, this incredible figure uh, in, in American business. And we're talking way before Martha Stewart, way before Oprah. She's running a major company in the Deep South, a woman. Talk about being ahead of her time. So Keeling dug deeper and began what would become a two-year project, finding out all there was to know about Tupperware's leading lady. And now he hopes to share her story in a new book, Tupperware Unsealed. It's more of a history book, it's an investigative chronicle, and it's a story of a trailblazing businesswoman who really should get a lot more focus and attention than she has. Brownie did what no woman ever did in the 50s. She took a leading role in turning a company from rags to riches. Her breakthrough, getting legions of women to hold Tupperware parties. Tupperware was designed with an accent on beauty. A sales strategy which became a global phenomenon. Bowl by bowl, homemakers suddenly had the chance to earn thousands and become the driving force behind Tupperware's legacy. All of a sudden, they could earn their own money. They could add something to the household. Brownie Wise wasn't a feminist, but yet she really was a liberating force for women. Here's an interesting tidbit. This home behind me is the former home of Brownie and also the former home to the humble beginnings of her revolutionary Tupperware parties. Can you believe it all starts here? This is it? Yeah, this is it. Wow. When uh, Brownie moved here at the beginning of 1952. As home Tupperware parties took off, Brownie became an American icon, a staple of Tupperware, and the first woman to grace the cover of Business Week. After she had run the company up until 1958, she had really become the focal point of Tupperware. She was in all of the national magazine articles. She was getting lots of press, lots of attention, and some would say that it went to her head. Well, Earl Tupper was the president of the company. He had all the stock, he held all the cards. He decided Brownie had gotten too much into Brownie and not enough into Tupperware and came down one January morning and essentially fired her and wrote her out of the company history. After an eight-year reign as Tupperware's leading lady, 
Brownie was gone, without a trace, and soon to be forgotten. A meeting of the board of directors was held on January 27, 1958, and it was voted to cancel the appointment of Brownie Humphrey Wise as vice president and general manager of Tupperware Home Parties, Inc. This letter is to serve as notification of same. Brownie made one more stab at the big time, forming her own party plan cosmetics company, but was unsuccessful. And in 1992, she died in obscurity at age 79, but left behind quite a legacy. We could do a better job of recognizing the people who helped make Orlando and Central Florida what it is today. And Brownie Wise is certainly one of those people. What an incredible story. Bob Keeling will have a book signing at the Urban Think Bookstore May 15th. So if you'd like more information, simply check out the links at our website. Well, up next, we all admire art in museums or galleries, and sometimes the bug bites us to begin collecting. But how do you know where to start? Well, reporter Jessica Sanchez caught up with an Orlando collector who's made an art of it all his adult life. I know, I've overdone it, and in some ways people call me obsessive, and I am, I admit to that. Josh Garrick knows his love of art goes beyond what is considered normal. We're now in the guest bathroom, and in the guest bathroom what I have is a collection of photography. But as far as obsessions go, his is unique. Well, these of course are my kitchen cabinets, but there's empty space above there, and so there's art there. Josh can trace his love of art back to his days as a teenager in rural Pennsylvania. I don't even know why this sticks in my mind so completely, but in seventh grade, I made a little plaster cast of the Parthenon. That fascination with ancient Greece has spawned this, an entire home from floor to ceiling covered with nearly 500 original works of art. You'll see that he incorporated ancient Greek pillars into the piece. People have asked me, uh, once you've acquired something and once you put it on the wall, do you ever go back and look at it? And I sure do. I absolutely do. Uh, I mean, I actually spend time uh, sometimes just sitting and looking and honestly just enjoying. The Central Florida home, while modest on the outside, is anything but on the inside. The Barking Dog by Keith Haring. Uh, Keith Haring was a student at the School of Visual Arts, but before I ever got there. Uh, so he came back and did this wonderful project called City Kids for Liberty and I was the coordinator of the project. It was a huge project and at the end of it he just walked over and just handed that to me and uh, so it was his way of saying thank you and of course that means an enormous amount to me. Much of Josh's collection comes from well-known artists such as Elizabeth Payton who were once his students at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. They are tokens of appreciation for their former professor. This extraordinary piece is again by a former student uh, and certainly a prized piece of the collection. This, uh, this is a local artist named Duncan McClellan, one of the prize pieces in the collection. Uh, this is blown glass, and as you can see, it's etched both on the inside and the outside of it. To me, it's a constant joy. It's an act of sharing, it's an act of love, it's an act of beauty, uh, it's an act of opening up your personality. It's safe to say that when it comes to the art of collecting art, Josh is the Picasso. But does it take a degree in art history to know what looks good and what doesn't? To the first time art buyer, it can feel that way. You, you need to try and get beyond the intimidation factor. You really need to simply allow yourself to enjoy a piece of art. Stop worrying, will your friends like it? Will it fit with some color over the sofa? Will it fit in some space or something like that? And you don't have to be a millionaire. Most people won't think twice about spending hundreds on a rug to decorate their floor, but they'll shudder at the thought of spending just as much on a painting to adorn their wall. That's because for beginners, the art market can be intimidating and confusing. How do you know if that picture you're getting is worth a thousand dollars or just a thousand words? It would be the same as if you were going out to buy a television set. Well, obviously, what you're going to do is you're going to visit different stores. I mean, I don't know a lot of people who would simply just go in and buy the first television set that they look at. A lot of people are going to do price comparison. Well, I mean, you can do some of that with art too. So for the first time art buyer, Josh's advice is to visit as many art galleries as you can. Get on their mailing list so you'll be invited to openings and special events. 
Some dealers caution against buying art that claims to be limited edition prints, saying oftentimes they are nothing more than overpriced signed posters. And others caution against relying on certificates of authenticity. I don't think there's hardly anything that's more personal than buying a piece of art. I mean, it, it, you really have to do it for yourself. I mean, you have to really love it. For Josh, buying art is like falling in love. While it can be an investment, art lovers and dealers see it more as a passion. There's that wonderful line that less is more. Mm -mm, not in this house. Nope. More is more. He makes it look really simple, doesn't he? Well, we're here again at the Wayne Dinch Performing Arts Center in Sanford, and many people remember it as the Helen Stairs Theater. You're about to learn why the name changed in just a second here, and to help answer those questions, joining me is Derek Powell, the associate theater manager here. Now, why the name change, Derek? Well, it's as a result of a very generous gift by the Wayne Dinch Charitable Foundation. They bought the building next door to the theatre for us. It cost $450,000 and they presented it to the theatre as a gift for our sole use. It doesn't mean to say that we're dropping the Helen Stairs Theatre entirely because we want to acknowledge the great deal of contribution that Helen and Carl made to the theatre so it will become the auditorium. Now as a result of the name change, there's also something else that's changing. Yes, it gives us much more opportunity to put on more shows and uh, next door being a rehearsal room as it now is, we also have room to store our costumes up there which we make ourselves or buy and convert and so on. That's uh, a very valuable asset because we used to store it about three miles away and now it's next door. Yeah, a lot closer. Uh, much closer, it's going to be much more economical too. Now let's talk about this theater because it hasn't always been a theater. No, it started off in 1923 as a cinema and it was called the Millane Theater at that time, which was the combination of the two names of the gentleman who owned it and opened it. And then it had a checkered history, uh, ups and downs throughout that century. It was a canteen, it was a, a vaudeville house, a variety of things fell into disrepair about the mid-1980s because it couldn't compete with the multiplex and so on. Now I had a chance to take a look at your Wall of Fame. Tell me more about some of the performances that have come through here. Oh, those are the shows that have been here and, and we like to keep a good record of them. They're both the repertory company shows, uh, such things as Oklahoma, um, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. And we also have professional people who come through. Uh, B.J. Thomas is one. The Von Trapp children came, the actual descendants of the Von Trapp family, well known from The Sound of Music. And actually, Rachmaninoff played here. Now, who do we have coming up? The Fantastics is the repertory company performance opening this season. Annie Get Your Gun, Nonsense, Hello Dolly. A lot. And wide variety <laughs> of shows, yes. To Absolutely. suit all tastes and ages. All righty. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. And we certainly appreciate that. If you'd like more information on the Wayne Dinch Performing Arts Center, simply log on to our website. Up next, Pie Pie Me Oh My. But first, let's check out what's going on around Central Florida. Visit the Garden Theater in Winter Garden for a trip back to 1939 with the reality-inspired play Moonlight and Magnolias, playing May 9th through the 25th. Call 407-877-4736 or visit wgtheater.org for more information. Also, see Dance at its finest with Surfscape Contemporary Dance Theater's performance, Raw, showing May 9th through the 10th at the Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna Beach. You can call 386-233-4885 or visit surfscapedance.org for more information. While you don't want to miss Oviedo artist Carl Knickerbocker's exhibit, Confessions of an Urban Primitive, now showing through June 1st at Janine Taylor Folk Art in Sanford. Call 407-323-2774 or visit jtfolkart.com for more information. You want to get into the swing of things? Well, head over to the annual Spring Jazz Stroll at Lou Gardens in Winter Park, May 10th. 
call 407-246-2620 or visit lougardens.org for more information. You want more? Visit wmfe.org slash arts for links to all these events and a chance to send us your ideas. Well, we have one more for you and you even have extra time to do it. It's the Norman Rockwell exhibit at the Orlando Museum of Art called American Chronicles, the Art of Norman Rockwell. It runs through May 26th and the museum is even extending its hours for the duration. You can learn more at our website. Now when the exhibit first opened, something very special happened. Composer Stella Song with the University of Central Florida created a piece that showcases the works of artist Norman Rockwell and it was performed by the Orlando Philharmonic. Here's how she did it. Take a look. The paintings of Norman Rockwell are recognized as a symbol of Americana. His images express the essence of the American spirit, capturing the nostalgia of a people and his depiction of American life. Now, this 20th century artist is getting a new level of recognition, thanks to the works of a 21st century composer. Stella Sung, a UCF professor, says it was Rockwell's paintings that inspired her to write the music that would bring them to life. I tried to capture what I thought was what Rockwell was trying to portray in the visuals, and I tried to portray that in a musical sense. Sung's musical journey began when Christopher Wilkins, the conductor of the Orlando Philharmonic, approached her about the idea. Uh, he realized that the Orlando Museum of Art was having an exhibit of the works of Norman Rockwell. So Chris, knowing that I had done some work with the Orlando Philharmonic before, using visuals and so on, uh, approached me about doing this project um, with uh, visuals and music. Sung selected five works from Rockwell's collection, The Art of Facing a Blank Canvas, Stay at Home, Checkers, Mississippi Murder, and Peace Corps. Her training as a classical pianist, coupled with computer technology, helped to create her state-of-the-art compositions. And so I work it out here on the piano, and then I put it into the notation program, and then it goes into the other program, and then it spits it out. Wow. Like magic. <laughs> You see the artist and he's facing a blank canvas. And there's a little clock and you see that there's a deadline and so on. So all artists face deadlines at some point. And what I wanted to capture there was that spirit that wonderful American spirit of people who can get themselves together uh, and unite and find a way to move forward. And I think that's what the Peace Corps was trying to say. I, I think her, the way that she created the compositions, are really, they really tell stories. They unfold much in the same way that Rockwell's pictures do. I believe you can kind of almost close your eyes and sort of go on that. Uh, they really evoke visual pictures, in, I think, in your mind as you listen to it. My hope is that this kind of work can, again, go across and open up um, to concert audiences, to symphony concert audiences, another way of thinking about the creation of artistic expression. What we like to do at orchestras and cultural institutions is create and to create exciting programs, and uh, to create such exciting programs that we fill the seats in the concert hall, and that people uh, have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity every time they come to the Orlando Philharmonic. The orchestra is performing Sung's new work titled Rockwell's Reflections, with live projections of his paintings for you to hear and see. I created a MIDI track, or a MIDI version of the music. The conductor studied the score from that, and the visual artists who created the DVDs upon which the Rockwell uh, paintings are projected, um, they use that to synchronize uh, the music and artwork together. Schillhammer says projects like this help to keep the orchestra current. The Orlando Philharmonic needs to be performing uh, American music and, and by living composers. We can't be a museum piece where we only play works of the past. We have to be a living, breathing, and dynamic institution that's playing works of, of the current day. 
Rockwell's unique collection of paintings all visualized a different story, each one evoking a different feeling. It's those emotions musical combinations are made of. All of them had something uh, for me, um, and, and each one, uh, there was a specific kind of feeling in each one, and I had the whole collection to choose from. Uh, but somehow these spoke to me, and um, so I hope they'll speak to the audiences as well. Rockwell is a signature artist who deserves a signature theme song. Every artist has a signature, so I figure Norman Rockwell needs to have one too. It's based on this uh, little theme here. And it's Norman Rockwell. <laughs> and so you'll hear that theme used throughout all the pieces in various different ways. America's greatest visions chronicled on canvas, now being brought to life through the art of music. What a beautiful way to bring the arts together. Well, up next, an art form that tickles several of the senses, sight, smell, and even taste. Every year, the town of celebration turns into the pie capital of the world with a unique event. So get your appetites ready for a piece of the action. A piece of pie offers a little piece of heaven, one sinful slice at a time. And at the 2008 Great American Pie Festival and Celebration, the term as American as apple pie takes on a whole new meaning. Just check out these creative concoctions. I am trying out key lime pie on a stick. Or the uh, sweet cream pie, I've never seen one of those. Um, we're doing pineapple, apple, Strawberry rhubarb, berry, coconut meringue, lemon meringue, chocolate meringue, peach. But the Great American Pie Festival isn't just about the crazy creations. It grew out of the very first national pie competition 14 years ago when they had, believe it or not, way too many pies. So we said, let's have a pie buffet. This is like the perfect thing to do. In fact, it's grown to include not just the commercial pie guys, but an amateur competition too. So each year, pie lovers from around the country gather in celebration, not only to compete, but to share their art with admiring and hungry crowds. Pie making is definitely an art form. Everybody has their own way of doing it. It's a way of expressing yourself. All you have to do is talk to a few bakers, and you can see in the way they describe what they do that it truly is an art. And the best place to express that art is right here in Central Florida. Florida is a fabulous place to bring this competition. But our amateur bakers oftentimes travel from states as far away as Washington, and they have no place to bake their pies. So they rent condos and vacation properties, and Orlando is one of the only places that you can have all that. But some battling bakers are homegrown, too. Meet Debbie Walter, an Orlando contestant who's passionate about pie. I've been baking for 30 years, at least. Through the years, that's become our thing. In fact, we do, we do pies for birthdays instead of cakes in our family because pies are obviously better. And when Debbie smelled the sweet aroma of a pie competition right here in her own backyard, she couldn't resist. I entered a creme de la creme apple pie, a very cherry pie. Um, my grandmother's recipe is a peach of a pie. Um, strawberry margarita cream cheese, and then my new signature pie is caramel macchiato pie. So how in the world does a judge pick from all that? The initial thing that I look for is the appearance, how it presents itself on the plate. From there, then you can go into the texture of it. How does it feel uh, when you put it in your mouth just a little bit? Does it have layers of flavors? Pie pundit Jim Waples, a seasoned yeah, local judge from Bay Hill, obviously knows his stuff. It's hard crusty. Hard. I've been involved with the pie festival for, this is my fifth year in judging the pie festival, and thoroughly enjoy it. But it's not all fun and games. The heat is on for these 80 amateur pie contestants to perform. They, they do have a, a set of rules, but the rules are really pretty simple. Just bake a good pie and uh, use the KISS method. Keep it simple, silly. The simplicity is so important in all foods that you do, you do. You can dress it up to make it look different, but the taste and the way that you prepare it can just get back to basics. So the judges go to work, and you know what they say, it's a tough job, but somebody's gotta do it. Bite by bite, pies face the taste test. It could be a, a great pie, but it needs a lot of work, 
because there's a lot of different things going on. Ooh, he's tough. Maybe the next one will be better. Okay, let's see what we have here. <laughs> well, they were generous with the filling. One, two, three. You got three different layers going there. This is called coffee cup pie, coffee cup chocolate pie. The coffee flavor is definitely coming through. Quite good. Well, we're all done here. Now it's time to go and see the winners. And after a long day, the pie kings and queens were finally crowned. Unfortunately, no first place for Orlando's Debbie Walter, but she vows to be back again. The best in show this year, a U.S. Route 1 Florida Key Lime Pie with Maine blueberries. Oh, delicious. Oh my gosh, I wouldn't know where to begin or end with all those pies. Well, anyway, that wraps it for us here at the Wayne Dinge Performing Arts Center. We certainly hope you have enjoyed our program. Don't forget to check us out on the web at wmfe.org slash arts. You can send us your ideas there, view our podcast, or get information about any of the stories that you've just seen. And don't forget Becky Morgan on the radio at 90.7 FM with the Arts Connection radio program. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Please join me next time when we meet a local author who's turning her book about nuclear accident victims into a documentary. It's quite a different way for me to be thinking. Although I tend to write visually in my stories, it's a whole other way of, of transposing it to the screen. I don't know how you learn that. I think you just do it. Plus, we check out local performers as they prepare for the annual Fringe Festival. All that and more coming up Thursday on The Arts Connection.